Welcome, everyone. I'm Ivy Rivera. I'm a psychic medium, a Taino Airwalk. This is the launch of my new show called Late Night Circus, where we're going to be talking about viral, trending current events, uh, worldwide, you know, news stories and different things happening in politics, the media. And we're going to break it down from a spiritual aspect where I can show you why I believe these things are happening intuitively, energetically, astrologically, spiritually. Why not only are these things occurring, but how do we apply it to our everyday lives? So what I want you to do is drop any uh, questions that you may have. If there are any additional topics that you would like to see me get to, I can't guarantee we're going to do it on this show. Uh, but if you follow me, you know, with all my shows and services, we pay attention to comments and we take all of your questions more toward um, the end for some of them. And some we may be popping up as we go. <clears throat> So one of the reasons I really wanted to do this show was because I'm fairly obsessed with current events. My degree is in journalism, and I have always seen the connections between what was happening in the world and what it meant on a higher universal scale. Like, what's the big picture behind all of this? And I would realize that often I felt like I was the only one seeing this. Like, am I the only one who sees this? Am I the only one who understands the intricate web of design here and how all these things are connected? And yeah, often I am. I'm the only one who seems to get the bigger picture and why these stories are unfolding. Not only the way that they're unfolding, but also with, with whom and when. Okay. And what does it mean is going to happen after that? Or how are we supposed to take it? So, um, my friends all know that, you know, this is something I discuss, uh, obsessively and, you know, it's kind of all I really care about in life. All right. And so this is a good opportunity for us to kind of get to it. Uh, I do see the world as a dark circus. This often seems absolutely ridiculous. And like they're just a bunch of clowns, uh, scary clowns running everything. And um, it's just like one show after another. Okay. It's just one big performance. So let's get at it. Some of the current events uh, going on recently that have stuck out to me as a psychic medium, all right, as a native. Uh, as a spiritual activist, these are the things that have stuck out to me as being super meaningful and stories we should start paying attention to because it is leading to more in the future. Uh, Mary, my beautiful producer, will be popping up some subtitles for you here on YouTube at Ask Ivy if you want to see you know, what exactly we're talking about. Uh, this video will be edited and um, put up also published on YouTube after the live. So give that about 48 hours. All right, let's get to the first story. Number one, a case of witchcraft, Gypsy Rose Blanchard. I don't pay a ton of attention to true crime because I feel like most of my life has been like a true crime story and it's just off-putting to me. Um, but this caught my eye over and over again. I would notice every single time I saw a story about Gypsy Rose Blanchard in the media, I felt like I was falling down a rabbit hole. I was so attracted to the energy of this girl. If you don't know the backstory, uh, you could Google it. I'm not going to get into all of it, but she was a victim of Munchausen by proxy and her mother pretending that she was sick, forcing surgeries and medication on her and everything ultimately led to a situation where in her early 20s, Gypsy Rose snapped and had her mother murdered. Uh, she went to prison for it and she just got out. Okay. So that's why it's in the media right now after almost 10 years. I believe, I believe it was like eight years. So I'm looking at the story over and over again. I even went so far as to purchase uh, one of the documentaries on it. And 
I realized why I was becoming sort of obsessed with it. There's a spiritual element here in an undeniable way. And intuitively, it was resonating with me as being very paranormal, but in a strange way compared to most true crime stories. And what I discovered a couple days ago was that Gypsy Rose Blanchard's mother okay, who had Munchausen by proxy and did this to her. Her name is Dee Dee Blanchard. And Dee Dee apparently took a jar, a cow tongue, a picture of Gypsy Rose and her boyfriend and some of Gypsy's menstrual blood, put it in this jar, put a hex on it, put a spell on it, and said to her daughter something along the lines of, I put a voodoo curse on you. You will never have love. She buried it in the yard. And I said, this is bat crazy. Okay. This is what I was waiting for. I was waiting to hear something nutty like this because there's clearly some underlying paranormal stuff coming at it from multiple angles. So this was the first thing I heard that made me say, yeah, there's no way Dee Dee Forget Gypsy's story. There's no way Dee Dee pulled this off, convincing doctor after doctor and surgeon after surgeon and pharmacists and, you know, would, would move from place to place. And she got free housing. I mean, Habitat for Humanity built them a home even. And then she happened to have the luck to get hit by Katrina in Louisiana. And any files that had been kept on Gypsy Rose were wiped out in the flood. So she got to do even more con jobs by saying there are no files. There's no proof. You know, I mean, this stuff doesn't just happen without some kind of influence, bigger influence, right? Like constant spell work or manifestation or, you know, something was behind this. Long story short, Dee Dee Blanchard's uh, I think it was her nephew or her cousin. You'll see him in some interviews if you Google it. But he spoke on how she had always been into witchcraft or, you know, voodoo or spell work or you could call it whatever you want. But that as a teenager, she was always on the Ouija board. And I warn you guys regularly about using tools without proper discernment training. OK, um, it is an avenue for dark arts if you don't know what you're doing or if you deliberately want to use it for dark arts. Right. It's a great tool, the Ouija board. So I guess she was always on the Ouija board. She had some tattoos that were also, um, you know, geared toward witchcraft and um, her I believe, again, it was her nephew who had said this specifically. He believes that she was working regularly on the doctors that she was working on the nurses, that she was working to um, use these spells to convince people, to give them money, to believe her story, okay? Uh, I 100% believe that was going on. Now, don't get me wrong, and I'm always saying, look, you're not going to receive a, a curse. That's a con, okay? People are just trying to get money out of you to reverse it. You can't have a spell put on you. Um, you, you know, these things aren't real. Now, what I mean by that is that there's a huge difference between something like voodoo and hoodoo. So when we're talking about something like hoodoo, which is what I think she was doing, you know, it requires you, your mental willingness to allow for the curse to take a toll on you. So it's essentially like saying, if you believe it, then it is true. If you want to know more about the difference between voodoo and hoodoo, uh, there's a great movie called The Skeleton Key. It's one of my favorites. You can go watch to learn more, okay? Because I don't have time to get into it today. But anyways, the idea that she was doing this made a lot of sense to me, given the way she so successfully pulled this off. Now, second thing I noticed about this case that looked exactly like possession, but understanding that possession does not occur unless you invite it. This was with the boy 
who actually murdered Dee Dee Blanchard. So Gypsy Rose had a boyfriend named Nicholas Godajan. And Nicholas Godajan traveled to her, wanted to be with her. And she was not, of course, allowed to be with him and she could not escape her mother. And in order to be together, she convinced Nick, who has some mental health problems and delays, and he is um, on the spectrum with autism as well. And she was able to convince him um, to, you know, murder the mother. But I put a video out on this. Okay. So those of you who follow me on TikTok probably would have seen this first. I put a video out on this about a week ago, an interview with him talking. And if you listen to him speak... He is incredibly honest. He is so raw. I love talking with people who have schizophrenia or, you know, other mental disorders because when they speak about the mediumship process, the voices that they hear, they speak which, with such authenticity that it pieces together what all of us have. All of us have innate mediumship ability. And it helps us to understand and bridge the gap between the worlds, okay? So whether you have mental illness or not, we're all mediums and we all hear these voices. We all receive this guidance, high vibrational or low vibrational, angels or devils. It happens all day, every day, all around the world, okay? And it's these people who can really help us to embrace what we have going on because to them, it's just a normal way of life, okay? So... I'm watching this interview with him and he says at one point, um, and again, you can, you can go onto my TikTok um, and you can watch this, but he says that there came a moment after Gypsy Rose had asked him to off her mother, there came a moment when he heard two distinct voices and he shifted into a trance-like state. And that's exactly how mediumship works. I do it all day, every day. That is my full-time job. I'm a medium, right? So you shift into a trance state, or we could call this physical mediumship or, you know, mental mediumship. And he said that in that moment, he heard from what he called an angel, you know, it was any high vibrational spirit, probably just collectively, all of them trying to talk to him. He called it an angel, said to him, listen, I guarantee that if you do it this way, everything will turn out fine, but you have to do it this way. This angel told him to take Gypsy and run. Don't do this. Don't get involved in this. Just leave the scene and we'll make sure, I promise you, everything will work out. Now, I am telling you what. I tell my students in the psychic mediumship course this from day one. You have to learn discernment because the minute you hear that voice, okay, that is telling you to pick a higher vibration, it will promise you everything is going to work out. And that is true intuition. Your gut instinct will never, ever fail you. The universe will never drop you. But heaven forbid you turn your back on it. You're on your own. And that's what he did because the other voice that he heard, which he referred to as the devil. Okay. I would just say it was a low vibrational energy. It could have been a million different spirits. So the negative energies that were speaking to him through Claire audience, right in his head, putting these thoughts in his head, it said that B is D E A, you know what, and encouraged him to do ultimately what he did in offing her. And what he explained with his raw honesty is that he wasn't sure what the heck happened to him in that moment because the way he said it was like, I don't know why this happened. He said, but I felt a rage. I was fine a minute ago, but I felt a rage brew up, take over me. And I almost felt like I had no choice but to do that. And he basically said there was a moment where he felt he still had that choice. And then he chose and got sucked in to that darker, lower energy. And again, I'm telling you, this is exactly how it goes all day, every day. Okay. You have an opportunity in a million different 
circumstances to choose a high vibration or a low vibration. And this is what we all need to be paying attention to. How often do we choose that high over that low? All right. Because once this negative and the low has a hold on you, your mind is like a mouse on a wheel. It's a cyclical pattern of negative thinking. It becomes possession where your hands become tied. And I'm not letting anybody off the hook. Okay. I'm not saying he didn't do it or that he doesn't deserve to be in None of that. None of us should be off the hook. We have to make the right choice in those moments quickly. All right. So that to me also looked like your typical mediumistic messaging system in activation in real time. And unfortunately he failed, you know, but, um, so very interesting. All right. Case of witchcraft, gypsy Rose Blanchard. I have a million more things to say on this, but I got my answers as to why I was paying so much attention to this story. So uh, I guess we'll leave it at that, you know, this week. All right, let's move on to another story. Uh, the Real Handmaid's Tale, Imprisoned for Miscarry. This is disgusting, shocking, and I feel like it's one of those absolute turning point type of stories that came out that deliberately got very little media coverage. So in Ohio, there was a young black woman named um, uh, Brittany Watts. Brittany Watts is like, I think 32. She's in her early thirties. And um, in Ohio, we have, you know, Roe v. Wade overturned. So she's pregnant. She uh, started bleeding and she went to the hospital. They told her, you're going to miscarry. This uh, pregnancy cannot be sustained. This is not a viable fetus. And she asked for help, uh, was my understanding. Okay, correct me if I'm wrong. But she asked with help to remove it. Um, and they said, nope. No, we're not going to do that for you. Sorry, you're going to have to carry it. Um, you know, and this is happening all, all over America to women every day. You're going to have to carry it full term. You're going to have to or until you, you know, miscarry on your own. And you may, of, of course, it puts the mother's life at great risk. But that's the America of freedom that we live in today, right? So no medical care. Well, a couple days later, she's bleeding again. You know, she's thinking the miscarriage is starting. She goes back to the hospital. She said, please help me. They said, nope, don't think so. Three times, three times, Brittany went back to the hospital and said, please help me. This is like happening. Like I am bleeding. Like I am in pain. They said, no, we're not going to help you. But that third time, she actually went home and miscarried. And when she didn't go back to the hospital, the, the doctors or the nurses turned her into the cops. And they convinced the cops to go to her house and to see if she had actually miscarried or if she had taken matters into her own hands uh, to, you know, rid, rid herself. Okay. There are certain words I don't think I'm allowed to use. And so I can't even believe they're letting me run the show this long, honestly. So anyways, okay. She, she tried, they wanted to have the cops look into her and see whether or not now, you know, not only would this, I believe never happen to a white woman in this country, but I also think it's a, a, a class issue, you know? So the devastating level of, if you can even call this medical care, right? Um, basically offing her um, is, I think, a class issue. I think it's a race issue. And that is a big part of what I think the spiritual aspect is on this story. Um, this bringing awareness through a Black woman's experience to all women because no, I don't care what color you are. You're not escaping this. Not in this country. Not anymore. You're not escaping this. This pulls the sisterhood together. Her story. This tale of tragedy. Because the cops did go to her house and they did find that she had miscarried 
in the toilet and had tried to put parts of the miscarriage in the garbage can. And then the way they spun the story, the cops said that she had the baby. They tried to convince the court uh, that she basically killed the baby by trying to flush it down the toilet, clog the pipes. And then they said she went about her day. She went about her day. Okay. The poor thing probably went to work or went about healing herself or went about after this horrible emotional and physical loss. She got locked up. So they lock her up. She's been in there months. She finally was released when a judge saw through this false story uh, that she did not murder you know, this, this, uh, child, but she actually had a miscarriage and, uh, she was running the risk of going to prison for, I think it was like a year or a year and a half for abuse of a corpse. Okay. So, um, this is the toxic environment that women now reside in. And this is how the media takes a story like this and tries to make it out to not be that big of a deal. A lot of you, I would love to hear in the comment section, have, did you even hear about this to this degree? Are you aware of this? Um, and my understanding of why this had to happen to her, um, again, is because it is a story that at this point... Uh, should be pulling all women together of all races to collectively start fighting for their autonomy, fighting for our rights, and to get uh, fired up once and for all. Because those of you who follow me know that I talk a lot about the revolution. I talk about the Hopi prophecy. I talk about the end times. And I talk about how there are certain phases we have been going through since 2019, with it peaking this year with women and the indigenous. Now the revolution has begun. And for those of you who follow astrology, what we're talking about is Pluto and Aquarius, which hit on the 20th of the month. Now, Pluto and Aquarius is putting us into this peak phase of the revolution, which is going to change things worldwide. And women lead that revolution. Okay. So God bless her. Brittany Watts, if I could give her a big hug. Okay. I, ugh. she deserves to be living on like a tropical island for the rest of her life. I mean, just like people feathering her and just catered to. Okay horrific story and disgusting and despicable how not only the doctors and the nurses got together with the cops to accuse her of this in the court system, but the fact that it even got that far, mind-blowing, mind-blowing, okay? All right, so there's that one. Let's move on to another one in the circus that is our dark world. We are going to talk on a little bit of a lighter note. <laughs> about cults versus movements. The Buffalo Bills and Swifties. Do we have any Swifties here? Do we have any Buffalo Bills fans here? All right, let me know in the comments section. <laughs> so um, one of the things that we have going on with Pluto and Aquarius, and I think even some other astrology, I would have to look it up. Um, you guys let me know in the comment section if you know which planets and which movements are instigating more cult-like activity from like the last year or two, but all the way through, I've heard 2025, 2026. Um, what that means is that on a more spiritual and intuitive note, when we see things like cults coming out, I notice, again, with my watchful, mediumistic eye, psychic eye, I automatically look for the polar opposite because the universe isn't trying to fool us. The universe isn't trying to trip us up or trick us, okay? It is an opportunity for us all to learn. So you look at what's toxic 
And then you look at what's good. You look at what's high vibrational and you look at what's low vibrational. And in the case of the Buffalo Bills and Taylor Swift, we have a coming together of these two worlds. I spotted this immediately. I became obsessed with this immediately. And I'll tell you why. I grew up uh, often in New York State, okay, when, especially when I was younger. And during that time, I noticed something weird happening with football, and in particular, the Buffalo Bills. I was put in Catholic school for a while. And in Catholic school, worshiping the Buffalo Bills, okay, in this area of New York, was as important as going to church. It was as important as that creepy Pledge of Allegiance I was forced to stand up and do every morning that I resented. I knew darn well when I was being brainwashed into a cult. I knew it at Catholic school every day. Not when we were talking about science or math necessarily, but definitely when we were teaching like religious class, we had to go to church. I knew when we had to do the Pledge of Allegiance, I was being indoctrinated into a cult. I could feel that. And I felt the same thing with the Buffalo Bills. Now, this is such a weird thing to have watched unfold. I'm 44 now, okay? So, like, I've seen over the years this get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And I have noticed that people went from enjoying football enjoying their team, go Bills, go, okay, to becoming like Bills Mafia. And every store in the mall was a Buffalo Bills store. And every piece of clothing you buy has Buffalo Bills. And I walk in to buy a car and there are cutout statues of Buffalo Bills players everywhere. And it's on everyone's car and it's like flags. I mean, it was like watching the Trump movement. I mean, it was like nuts. Right. And people started to say, does there seem to be like something weirder going on with this? Like, what is it? Is it racism? Like, what is it? And I was like, I'll tell you what it is, but it's not time yet. Watch this. Okay. Now people who are obsessed with the Buffalo bills tend to have maybe no personality or they have avoidant and escapist issues. I've learned this firsthand with many a clients or people I've dated, or I'm, I'm just very careful to avoid. Um, they can become absolutely obsessed because things in their life aren't going very well and they have nothing else going on. So they dive into, there's also a lot of loneliness there. So they dive into pretending that this is a culture, okay? That like being into a sports team is a culture somehow. It's their only form of entertainment. Um, you know, when the team loses, the whole area, if you reside in this in this area, you realize people are aggressive, they're nasty, they're depressed. Nothing like a sports team should be causing this level of distress or intoxicated joy, okay? It's nutty. Now, what has also happened in recent years is that people who come here from outside the New York area to perform, comedians, stage performers, they started speaking out on how creepy the people of this area are. So they have said to their audiences, have you seen Buffalo? Have you performed in Buffalo? Do you see how nutty these people act? Because people in the audience will shout out and interrupt shows to shout out names of Buffalo Bills players. And whatever the performer, the comedian on stage is talking about or doing, they don't even know like how to respond to that. They're like, what a weird thing to say. Like, it doesn't have anything to do with what I'm talking about. It doesn't have anything to do with the performance. No one else in the room understands what you're even doing or saying, right? It's so off base, so unaware, like no, zero audience awareness, even when they're in the audience. It's so weird. And so I'm like, okay, I'm definitely not the only one who sees it, <laughs> okay? So uh, what ends up happening here? is that Taylor Swift, who is leading 
the opposite, okay, of what I believe is a toxic cult because now murders have happened at these sporting events. Um, the Buffalo Bills just lost the other night. And some of the players have had to take down their social media because they're getting death threats. Uh, fans have physically attacked them. I mean, they, they've lost it, okay? It, it's a cult. 100% it's a cult. When you have nothing else in life, you join a cult. This is what happens. Now, Taylor Swift, the opposite of a cult, okay? I know the Swifties. Let me know if you are one in the comments section. I know that it can sometimes seem culty. Uh, she has like a, a cult-like following. However, you know, I really feel that the majority, and I, I don't really follow her, so I don't know a lot about it, but I feel like the majority of what she's doing for like the women's movement and um, mindfulness and self-healing and, you know, being an advocate, an advocate uh, for like, you know, not only women's uh, women empower in women empowerment, but also like speaking out against toxicity or toxic masculinity and, you know, attacks from the world around you. I mean, she's a huge player um, in the women's movement for sure. And she is going to be more clearly seen in, uh, you know, the younger generations over the next, I think, 10, 20 years and what her influence is, you know, so whether you want to say she's kind of like Madonna or, you know, um, she's absolutely amazing. Well, she started dating one of the NFL players. And so she started coming to Buffalo a lot. And some of the Buffalonians, I guess, started basically stalking her. Right. So anyways, long story short, um, I thought it was really interesting to see that we have this cult that I've been observing since I was a kid with the Buffalo Bills and this Buffalo Bills mafia and this obsession um, that rules their mood, their life, their choices, even destruction, even violence against Taylor Swift, who was coming to the actual Buffalo Bills games and spent a lot of time. And uh, the high vibrational movement that she is creating for feminism and to watch those two worlds come together, I was like, bam, there it is. My screen just went off. Let me see if I can get everything back. All right. So uh, very interesting. Again, when you're watching something like the development of a dark movement, potentially, it doesn't have to be. Uh, football's great. You love it? Love it. That's great. But if it becomes a dark movement and people are becoming obsessive and they're not thinking anymore, logic has left the building, um, they're essentially becoming possessed. And we see mass numbers of this, uh, you know, people doing this, this happening, always expect on a spiritual level, on a universal level to see the counter effect with a polar opposite movement or someone else leading something. and. You can see them, okay? Simultaneous, side by side, just like that. So I thought that was pretty awesome. Sorry, Bills fans. Um, there's a level of normalcy and a lot of people in the culture culture <laughs> have exceeded it. Okay, it's time somebody calls it out. All right, let's move on to uh, skeletons out of the closet. A little bit of a more um, unfortunate, serious story here. So skeletons out of the closet, the cops buried bodies. For those of you who are not aware, this is another story that did not get, in my opinion, anywhere near the media coverage. It should have. I believe that in time it may, um, but we need to be our own media, okay? Not waiting on journalists to pump this thing out because they won't, okay? The media is all owned and operated, the same people, same stuff, regurgitated over and over and over again. So go hunt this out. Break it up into little clips. Put it out on your TikTok. Get the story out here. Listen to how sick this is. So Jackson, Mississippi, okay, where Emmett Till, the 14-year-old boy, the black boy who was viciously, horrifically offed in, um, I don't have the exact year, I want to say 56. I'm, I'm not sure when that was. Someone can put it in the comment section. Emmett Till. Okay, Google him. You probably already know exactly who he is and exactly what the story is. Well, his story came from Jackson, Mississippi. 
And in Jackson, Mississippi, a couple weeks ago, um, a man named uh, Dexter Wade had been missing. And his mother, Betterson Wade, was looking for him. I believe she was looking for him for about six months. Okay, so this went from spring all the way into um, um, just a couple months ago. So she was calling the police. She was calling the police. She's filing missing persons reports. Saying, Where is he? Where is he? You know, and the police kept telling her, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I have no idea. Um, the police eventually admitted to running him over and burying his body in the yard at the police station. Yeah. Um, he had his wallet on him when they found the body and they dug him up. Uh, they realized that he had his wallet on him that had his ID, his home address, um, information connected to even his mother, his family. So it's not like the police didn't know, A, because they're the ones who ran him over, and B, because they buried him, but also because they never contacted his mom or family, even having all of that information very deliberately, obviously, because all of the contact information was right there on his person. Now, what we also found was that there were 215 other unmarked graves back there. None of the family members were contacted about these missing, um, mostly or probably all, I'm guessing, um, Black or maybe Hispanic, we'll find out more, um, people, 215 unmarked graves so far, so far were found um, back there where the cops have been burying bodies. And um, they have the audacity to charge, the mom had to pay to get the bodies, the body dug up. So just to make it hard, just to add a little more red tape just to be a little more disgusting, okay, and evil. The cops said, well, you want the body? You have to pay to get the body. So these families have been paying money to dig up the graves of their oft children or family members and loved ones, okay? Remarkable, remarkable. But these unmarked graves had these like metal rods with these little like wooden planks on them. And they were numbered. And we realize now that Dexter is number 672. So while 215 may have already been found, where are the other ones? Because if he's 672, God only knows. How many we're talking about here? Welcome to Mississippi. Welcome to America. All right. How much has changed since Emmett Till? Wow, not much. What a shock, right? So also with this particular case, three years ago, the police killed Betterson Wade, the mom, her brother. And she is the head plaintiff in that case. Okay. Still, still trying to get justice. Uh, so what do I think? What do I think the spiritual, intuitive, astrological, energetic lesson is here? Well, like I've been saying the last few years, again, for those of you that follow me, end times, Hopi prophecy, the revolution that's going on right now. Beginning in 2019, it began um, with uh, Black people and LGBTQ collectively. Okay, so now we've moved into the phase where we're talking about women and Indigenous people. But then it was Black people, African-Americans, and the LGBTQ community. So around that time, shortly after that, we would have seen things like the case with Floyd, George Floyd, okay? Openly, on the street, in the middle of the day, in the middle of broad daylight, in the middle of broad daylight, okay? 
So this is in my belief is that this is part of that story because while it was really activated around that time as part of the revolution, it's not over, obviously, right? It's going to continue. I talked about this a little bit more in, in my 2024 predictions. So if you didn't, you know, you want to watch that video, it's up on my YouTube at Ask Ivy. So the 2024, like, collective predictions that I did for the world. I talked a little bit more about this process of the revolution. And I I do believe this is a huge part of that story, um, which also makes sense because the mom, Betterson, uh, Wade, you know, the fact that that her brother was off three years ago, it fits in perfectly with that timeline. Okay, so, I mean, you can't make this stuff up. I also think that it's connected a lot to the part of the revolution that we're in now with women and indigenous people leading this revolution, the final phase, the peak phase, because we have also dug up countless indigenous bodies, unmarked graves of children that were forced into the Indian schools, not only here in America, which is also being hidden, but also in Canada, and it's ha it's happening elsewhere. So these stories are directly linked in just in the way that the that the the people um, were handled, okay, mistreated, abused, oft, and then the bodies buried in the unmarked graves. I mean, when we start to see a common theme like that, Okay, you just know that the universe has sort of set it up so that it reads as like a connecting script, right? Sort of like symbolism. Symbolism is a huge part of mediumship, always. All right. God bless that, that those families. Okay, we need to pray for them. We need to send them healing. We need to keep sharing these stories and we need to motivate them to keep on with the fight because people can get a broken heart you've ever lost a pet or if you've ever lost a, a couple that was actually in love, you know, sometimes we lose somebody and it just breaks our heart and we pass away or our, we lose our minds or our soul dies. Okay. Or we go dark. And when, even if these weren't necessarily people that were super close in their family, the story being so dark and disgusting and tragic and knowing this is still our system with their boot on our neck every day, that could be enough to break some people, okay? So send them the strength and healing that they need and speak out on this. Absolutely amazing. This leads us right into the next story. And this is sort of a different segment of the show because we got to sort of wrap it up, okay? At this point, it starts to take a, a little while. And um, bear with me again because this is my first late night circus show. And so um, I want to, you know, try to keep it at an hour, but we'll see. Uh, so the second half of the show, if this were news broadcast, okay, it would be getting shorter, all right, these stories. So we're going to move into some short stories here. Uh, so the second half is uh, we're going to call it... Um, uh, karma on the playground. All right. So here's where we start to see some karma playing out. And, um, I'm going to, that, that is the general theme of, um, these stories spiritually, intuitively, astrologically. All right. Cause we do have a lot of karma playing out in the world right now. A lot of, um, exposés, you know, um, a ton of people in high up positions, falling hard, falling fast, all right. So uh, the first thing I want to talk about is Gaza and the um, Congo. All right. So Gaza and the Congo, uh, where where we are. Um, so, you know, we have a, um, a genocide going on and uh, in Gaza. Uh, that more people are familiar with, all right? But if you're not familiar, there are a bunch of them going on. And the next one that's is starting to get a lot of publicity is in the Congo. So we want to um, take a closer look at all of that and stay on top of what's going on with the leaders in regards to solutions. Are we even talking about solutions? Um, are we just going to watch this play out? Like we're actually watching uh, 
what's happening in Palestine with all of the civilians just being wiped out day after day, night after night, you know, thousands after thousands after tens of thousands. We just were just watching it. Um, I don't know about you, but I was not fully aware that the UN was powerless. I mean, I thought, I know people in the UN, I thought there was a point. I thought that when the entire UN got together and voted to stop Israel from murdering everyone in Gaza, I thought because everyone voted for it, it meant something. No, it was enough apparently for the good old US of A, okay, to say, no, I want it to continue. And everyone was like, okay, I guess it continues. I'm absolutely speechless. All right. So, um, but you know, that is what's happening. And, and if you watch what's essentially going on is that the people are leading movements, the people are leading the revolutions, the people are finding ways, okay, to go up against um, these structures that are continuing these crimes. And uh, leader of Israel, Netanyahu said, uh, I think it was three times last week, probably more than that. But I mean, I know it was at least like publicized where he went up to a microphone and he said it at least three times. He said, no way, there will be no two-state solution to, to Palestine. No two-state solution. We're going to take this all the way. So he's just putting it out there, blatant. And this was a turning point because when we know that supposedly, right, Biden had gone to him a couple times and said, you know, it's getting hard for the U.S. to keep sending you billions and trillions of dollars. The people don't like what you're doing. Could you talk about a two-state solution? Apparently, he's considered a total joke or said nothing. And Netanyahu came at it harder, came at it more publicly than ever, came out and said, no way in H-E double hockey sticks is this going to happen. Eat it. OK, pay up, pay up, Americans. Go be, you know, good little pawns and pay your taxes. Well, it's a turning point because at this point. Americans have essentially, and even I've even heard Americans in like the media or news broadcasters or high opposition say, I'm not paying my taxes. This is it. I am out. I am out. Because after Netanyahu said, no way will I do a two-state solution over and over and over again, Biden said, can we send him 19 billion? Okay, come on. We need to do this. We need to send him more. And people were like, I'm done. And now I'm done. So uh, this is going to change the game. Uh, everyone's out. We've boycotted everything. I mean, I think we're boycotting. For those of you who don't know who to boycott or how, what to boycott, go on to any of my platforms. But it's probably easiest to find on TikTok. I've listed it in videos. I'm going to be putting out another video. Um. We've boycotted to the extent that Starbucks is kissing our high knees and begging us to come back. We've boycotted to the extent to get against McDonald's and stuff. But see how quick those Stanley Cups came out after the boycott? They got hit really hard like they never have before. And those Stanley Cups came out immediately. And every pawn in the every pawn sheep in the game went out and hoarded them up like a bunch of clowns in this circus. Now we also see the them starting to threaten. So like McDonald's, you know. Starbucks. I mean, they're trying to now get it so so that Americans are it's illegal for Americans to boycott Israel. OK, um, which is a longer story and we don't have time for that today. Anyways, long story short, uh, keep boycotting what is going on in Gaza and Congo. Keep your eyes set. Keep your eyes set. because That's where it's happening. That's where the revolution is going to be, especially at home here in America, because we are the biggest cause of all of this happening over there in Palestine to these people. And um, we are going to see that people um, come together here, I think, in this country finally to do some damage. Uh, to the government and to stop this from happening. I believe it's something like one third of the population has to collectively get together to actually force something to go through. So for example, if one third of us did not pay taxes and who wants to pay your taxes anyways, 
we get taxed, then we get taxed again for everything we buy. We're the only place like in the world that has that system. Okay. Who wants to pay them anyhow? If we all just saved our money, one third of us, I guess, right? Got together, we're going to create change. So this is what I believe we're going to see next. And I think it's part of the bigger revolution because it teaches us how, just based on this one particular issue, um, these crimes, what's happening in that one spot in Gaza, it trains us up to understand that things like the UN apparently have no power and what to do about it as citizens, all right? And the rest of the world can um, mimic as we go forward because this isn't the last battle for sure that we'll be fighting. Now, this leads us right into the next story, which is politics. The race is racing. I'm going to run through these real quick. What's going on in uh, the dark circus that is American politics we um, are basically down to Biden and Trump. DeSantis dropped out. Um, he's kicking rocks with his crazy lady boots and his weird smile. And is like, I don't know. He's got some stuff going on there, I think, um, mentally. But anyways, with his dropping out, we're looking at what literally looks like a circus. OK, I mean, it is the performance here is ridiculous. It's over. Um I think for both of these players, we uh, we also have. I'm forgetting her name, Haley, Nikki Haley, Haley. We have we have a, a woman also in the running. Okay, on the Republican side, yeah, Nikki Haley. I think I'm saying her name right. You guys, let me know in the comments. Um, and it could very well be. It could be the first time we have a woman president. Entirely possible. Um, also, I think if Trump were to be elected, he he would. There's a high likelihood he kicks it, you know, I mean, he's really old and really deteriorating fast. Um, and she becomes right. The president. So that's an interesting dynamic to look at. And this is not a prediction show. I'm not making predictions about exactly what's going to happen. We have way too many hands in the pot and too much free will happening right here. Uh, and on top of the corruption, but I think it's an interesting thing to look at right now, given where we are. I also think the bigger picture beyond any of that. Okay. Because ultimately there will come a time when it's like, who cares about America in the rear view mirror. Okay. Um, we were built on Indian burial ground. This karma was inevitable. Okay. To come to America. Um, but ultimately why I think this is an important story right now and what's happening with the politics is that it is the choice, the choices that Biden, the Democratic Party have made um, in supporting uh, the genocide going on in Palestine that has cost him the election most likely, or at least is greatly threatening his position in the election because so many people, how many of you did not know that Mm, famous movie stars and musicians and politicians that you really liked or supported or backed. How did, did you know that they were all backing Israel? Okay. Um, in this, uh, I don't think so. I, th I think we didn't, a lot of people that I don't even think really fully understood what APAC was and how big it is and how we work for Israel. Okay. So a lot of wake up calls. So those two stories are directly connected. Uh, in the next story, Watching the war on the big screen. Let's talk about the Oscars. We've got women in the forefront again and indigenous. Here we go again. So I thought it was really interesting that the movie Barbie, which I'm dying to see, but I haven't had time. I'm also dying to see even more so um, Killers of the Flower Moon. Have you guys seen these? I would love to hear your feedback in the comment section, what you, um, how, how you experience these movies to be. But um, I was surprised to hear that the Barbie movie, which was, you know, really focused on feminism, um, received like awards or it was up for like best movie, best production, best supporting actor and actress, um, best um, design, best two new songs, best costume design. I mean, on and on and on on and on. I mean, it was essentially like the best of everything, like the best thing that ever happened. However, the woman who played Barbie was snubbed. Like she did not get an, you know, an award for that. I just thought that was interesting. Neither did the woman who like produced it, like, or directed it. Like neither did she. Okay. So, but like Ken was a big deal in the awards. I don't know this whole story. 
Okay. Again, this is on my uh, karma on the playground list or just short stories. I haven't looked into this a ton, but I do find that odd. I find it as ultimately a snub to feminism when it came down to the Oscars. Now on the flip side, we have Lily Gladstone, um, our first Native American woman to win. Okay, in the Oscars, um, Best Actress, and she uh, was in Killers of the Flower Moon. She made this movie with Leonardo DiCaprio, if you're not familiar, and it was the Osage people. And a, a real story about um, how their town was essentially offed and taken over by a bunch of, you know, white people who came in to steal their wealth when they had found oil. Um, I don't have the exact dates on that, um, but I believe it was like the early like 1920s or something. And um, anyways, she won. She won this award. So here again, we see the women in the revolution. We see women and indigenous as this um, final sort of level up phase Okay, um, in these like end times. And what we're going to see from here is like the beginning, it's going to catch on like fire. And what I love about the way she handled this, I just put this post up with her exact quote, I don't have it here in front of me, but you can go to my Facebook or, um, you know, my Instagram and see it. She basically said, what took so long? Unacceptable. Most of the movies you make are on native land. What took so long? I love it. Love it. Love it. Okay. Amazing. She's amazing. Uh, let's move into another story here. We're going to be wrapping this up. I want to talk about baby journalists. Baby journalists, the revolution. Huge part. Huge part. Okay. Of the revolution is going to involve, again, things like film. Okay. As we just discussed. Uh, the news. The media. Um being able to take journalism back. So, uh, like I said in the beginning of the show, you know, my degrees in journalism, that's what I'd always planned on doing. And I know how corrupt the system is. So I was going to do freelance, you know, and I was trained in watchdog and I wanted to make sure, you know, that I was exposing serious stories, real stories, international stories that were being like buried or what, what have you. And, um, <laughs> We haven't had real journalism out there in so long. I think that I know that on a larger spiritual level, on a universal scale, and also we see this a ton in the astrology, again, um, a lot of it having to do with Pluto and Aquarius, which hit on the 20th, but we're seeing that the media is going to be taken over and everyone on TikTok, we already do pretty darn well on here, right? Um, but by real people, real journalists, it has to happen. We have to get back uh, to the truth. And we're seeing this play out in Gaza with the journalists there from Motaz, um, you know, to I'm trying to I'm trying to think of her name, the girl with the curly hair, Bassan. Uh, Bison. Um, there was another girl. Um, no, I know Motaz just left. I think it was yesterday. He was able to evacuate and he did leave, which I think was brilliant because he has a bigger story to tell. He could do better and do more from outside of that space. They have maxed out, not all of them, but most of them, they have maxed out the storytelling they could possibly do. What I find phenomenal about the journalists there, okay, is first of all, the death rate is unprecedented. I believe it's at like 120, 125. It is the most ever journalist murder in a targeted way where they're receiving texts every day, they're receiving death threats, their families are being threatened and their families are being outed. I mean, they are, the IDF is bombarding them 24 seven with these threats, then literally finding them and wiping them out. Can you imagine this? And they can't leave some of them, obviously, you know, because they can't, but then like when they have the opportunities to, sometimes they're they're torn. Um, the one journalist, please put her name in the comment section if you have it. I know her children just went, she stayed. She stayed. She said, I'm not going. My story is not done here. I mean, the guts, okay, of these people. My God, my God. So these amazing journalists now are sometimes with not a lot else to do, okay, have started doing this beautiful thing where they try to cheer up the kids and some some of the adults there will like put on clown makeup or 
try to do funny dances and gather the children together and do a makeshift kind of day at school and gym class and anything. I mean, they're just trying to do anything to, to keep these children's spirits alive while they know that, you know, they're losing limbs and, you know, they have no anesthesia. They're having their limbs cut off without any anesthesia. Their parents are gone and deceased. They have no family. They have nothing but each other, nothing but each other. Okay. These people. And the adults are also um, really focused on getting the kids to talk more about how they used to live or how they want to live in the future or what they dream about. And I watch video after video of this. So many of these children are saying, I want to be a journalist. That's what I'm going to do. And the journalists have started taking the children and giving them a mic and giving them the vest and giving them the helmet. And they're letting them speak about the atrocities that are going on. OK, and they are nailing it. I mean, these kids are on fire. Also, the other thing I find interesting about this on a more universal scale is that never in my life anyways, have I ever seen a situation, even in times of war, where journalists had journalists talking about the journalists. All of these journalists have like media accounts that are like mimicking them. And I think Motaz ended up with like eight eight point two million new subscribers in a matter of like three days or something, you know, when he really started getting into this like last month. But like they now have not only I'm not talking about just like fake accounts or bot accounts. I'm talking about other people who are stepping up and acting as journalists to speak on their behalf. Okay, of these journalists in Gaza. And so they're taking their content and they're pumping it out. They're pumping it out. They're duetting it. They're stitching it, right? They're going deep dive. They're getting people. If if Bassan, for example, says, I want a two-week strike, which I believe just happened, started yesterday, right? A boycott, like a full-on boycott, a strike. We're not spending any money. When they say something like that, they have these journalists, these sort of self-made journalists working under them to get it out. This is amazing. I mean, this is amazing. Okay. So I love, um, what's happening here with that, even in the darkness and, um, 100% that's going to be, uh, something that we see more. I want to say in the next, you know, 10 to 12 years, we see it in the astrology and on a universal scale, because it's the only way we're going to get in checks and balances, like things back in balance where like truth is becoming um, more known and people are less brainwashed and, and the right stories, you know, are being told. So it's going to require um, bold journalists, real journalists to be seen. And quite frankly, we got to wipe out what's here because clearly they're not doing the job. So a whole new generation or two or three, okay, of new journalists coming in. Let's move on to another story. Then we got one more after this, but it's not a real story. So this is basically the end of the show and I'm going to take your questions uh, or comments. If you haven't already posted your questions or comments, do them at this time. And also um, I forgot to ask you guys, I think if you could please give this video a thumbs up, donations are always appreciated. Uh, if you could also subscribe, please do whatever platform you're on. Also follow me on my YouTube channel. That's super, super important for me. Uh, so I could keep pumping out new content um, at ask IEV and comments help move this video along in the algorithm. So I appreciate you guys. Thank you so much. Oh, also, uh, post any stories you want to hear. Okay. And if you're watching this video after on the replay, um, please post in the comment section. I'm going to keep checking just to see what you guys, if you want me to continue on with the show, what things you would like to see me talk about. Um, cause it's a lot of prep work. Okay. All right. So let's talk about passport bros. Beware. So all the lovely gentlemen that have decided that they despise women more than they already did here in America uh, for us asking for anything, and we're not accepting the crumbs on the floor anymore. We have our own paychecks and bank accounts, and they can eat it, right? So, uh, you know, these men who, who despise us have decided that uh, since they bring nothing to the table and they want subservient women... Um, who are going to cater to them. And American women have said, good luck, DB, okay, we're out, uh, that they are going to travel. And they're going to go to places like South America, and they're going to sort of buy those women, you know, or they're going to kind of con those women um, who they believe uh, big, big misunderstanding in the Latino community. I will say that. Okay. We are not subservient people. Uh, but they want that tradition without having to do any of the traditional male work. So these passport bros have been taking a ton of money and traveling, um, 
you know, overseas to do this. And apparently in the last, I believe it's a week, eight of them have gone missing in South America. In South America. So women are playing them. Uh, women's empowerment yet again. All right. There's some karma on the playground. Uh, you want to go play that game? You're definitely going to have to be strong in playing that game. <laughs> so everyone, everyone is uh, ready and waiting, apparently, uh, for them to, you know, arrive. And that's the end of them. And you know the police uh, there don't care. <laughs> so good luck. Good luck with all that. That is karma at its best. That is a front row seat to the karma show at its best. I think it's hilarious. All right. And then uh, the last thing I want to mention, all right, and we'll get into any Q&A you guys may have here, is the Vatican. The Vatican on romance. Believe it or not, he came out and said, sex is for pleasure. Oh, my God. All right. Now, I think there is a lot of potential negative circumstances that may come of this, but I also think that this is going to end up being connected um, a lot in the future, maybe to some LGBTQ storylines, to um, women's physical autonomy, and uh, to obviously marriage, okay, and divorce. So within the Catholic Church, and the church, of course, runs everything, and we can thank for colonization all over the world, runs our government, blah, 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 right? Very, very interesting that at this point, the Vatican says sex is for pleasure, and that's okay. I could not believe it. My jaw was on the ground, okay? It, very interesting. Like why? Makes you makes you ask. Okay. So I think there's a bigger story coming here. Makes you wonder why. That is connected uh to something on a universal scale. And it's it's about it's a it's it's about damn time. Okay, let's get real. Um, of course, they are just trying to survive. The church is scra scraping and scratching and digging to hold on to any, you know, members of the cult that they possibly can. Uh, all right. So, Mary, my beautiful producer, do we have any questions or comments that we should be popping up? on any of these topics or are we at time? Okay, so we are at time. I do see some questions in the comment section here, um, but I'll be getting back to you in the feed once this is published because it's on other things, okay? But essentially, if you want to take a psychic mediumship training course with me, tarot, astrology, Reiki, paranormal, empathic, anything, you can go to ivyleaguepsychicacademy.com. And if you want to book a reading with me, including uh, paranormal consults, you know, cleansing, psychic mediumship, life contract, love readings, money readings, whatever, uh, you can go to ivyriverapsychicmedium.com. Let me know if you like this show and if I should continue. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night.